<laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church uh, this morning. Into May, May bank holiday. Have you all got exciting plans for the bank holiday? No. Me neither. <laughs> that started it on a downer, hasn't it? That's Hopefully it will be a nice sunny day tomorrow, though, and you can do something fun. It's a nice sunny day today, isn't it? Uh, we're continuing um, our uh, sort of meander through Mark's gospel, um, and today's the theme of today's uh, service, which I'm aware you didn't know because last week it said it was going to be a surprise, and this week Eddie's away, so there are no sheeps. Um, the theme of this week is uh, the tradition of the elders. So we're going to be thinking uh, about traditions. So I wonder, uh, there's a question on the screen, have you got any traditions that, uh, in your family? So we find out over here that the Hargreaves used to have KFC on Christmas Eve, that that was a kind of family tradition. Um, any, anyone else got any traditions, maybe? Go on, Barbara. Yeah, so, uh, so the, uh, Barbara's house is the, uh, the cafe on a Friday night, which is where the family come round, isn't it? And you have a, a variety of options to cater for the, the different tastes of the family. Any other traditions that you might have? No, it's too early in the service for this, isn't it? This, we'll, we'll warm up, we'll come back to it maybe. A good Friday walk, yeah, with... Uh, that's a, a tradition, isn't it, that we have. Um, we're going to be thinking about some of the traditions of the church um, maybe on, later on. Um, for now, though, shall we come before God uh, in, uh, not in prayer, in worship uh, as we uh, begin our service in song. We're going to sing twice. Um, the first is All Heaven Declares. Let's stand together and sing.
please take a seat. And let's come before God in prayer now. So Lord God, we gather together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you and eager to hear your word. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit and may the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord. Amen. Just uh, got a couple of notices um, to give you. Is it okay? All right. <laughs> you looked worried. Right. Okay. Sorry. Um, a couple of notices that I've been asked to give you. Um, first of all, we're invited to join Staxted's Methodist Church um, on Sunday, the 12th of May. That's next Sunday uh, at 6 p.m when the speaker will be Reverend Daniel Burton, who is now a vicar in Oldham, uh, but was trained as a Baptist minister uh, and was brought up at Waterbarn Baptist Church. Uh, and so if you remember Daniel uh, and you would like to hear him speak, or if you, even if you don't know him, but you would like to hear Daniel speak, um, we can go to Staxted's Methodist Church next Sunday uh, at 6 p.m. for their service there. Um, there's also um, a, an ecumenical service um, on Thursday for Ascension Day. Um, so Thursday the 9th of May at 7.30pm uh, and that will be held at St. Peter's Church in Haslingdon. Um, so uh, that's for all the churches uh, across Rosendale to come together um, to pray and to worship uh, together. Uh, on Ascension Day, which is this Thursday um, at half past seven, St. Peter's Church in Haslingdon. And the only other notice, I think, to give is that this week it is the in-person Bible study. So Thursday, uh, one o'clock. Um, yes, I've got that right. I was just checking because I've lost track of my weeks a little bit. But yes, so this week it will be the in-person Bible study here uh, at one o'clock. Okay, right, um, put your hand up if you have ever heard of or had a bowl of Fruit Loops cereal. It's an American cereal, so I'm guessing maybe not many people will have had it. Have, you've heard of them, heard of Fruit Loops. They mention them on films quite often, don't they, Fruit Loops? Now, I was reading something recently that said Fruit Loops, so Fruit Loops, an American cereal, I think they look a little bit like Cheerios, sort of little O's, but they're different colours, and as the name suggests, are fruity, I think. I've never had any, so I don't know. But I was reading something that said apparently um, they all taste, even the different colours, there's green ones and there's red ones, I know that, I don't know what other colours they are, might be some yellowy ones, um, but all the different colours of the Fruit Loops taste the same. But because your mind sees the colour, your mind thinks that they're different colours. So if you get a spoonful of Fruit Loops, you will think that you're tasting different flavours because your mind will do something, will look at the different, the different colours and assume that it's a red one, you think, well, that must be kind of strawberry or something, and a yellow one might be lemon, I don't know. Um, so your mind plays six, but if you close your eyes and taste them, they all taste the same. You can't tell what different colour you're eating. And so it got me thinking, I wonder if there are other foods like that where they're all the same and it's just our mind playing a trick on us. And I've had a suspicion for a while. I don't, I don't eat crisps, but I've had a suspicion for a while that crisps are all just the same and it's just the packet that are different. 
You can, you, why are you saying that? Who wants to come then and disprove my theory? Bro, did you like crisps? What's that? Do you like crisps? Noah, do you like crisps? Come on then. A slightly more enthusiastic. <laughs> okay. Right, oh, sorry, I should explain what I'm doing. I'm just whacking a blindfold on you there. Right, Noah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to blindfold you, okay, and then I'm going to give you a crisp out of my packet, okay, and everyone here will see what flavour it is, okay, but I think that you will say it's ready salted, yeah, okay? Because I think that you won't be able to tell, yeah, the difference because you won't see what colour packet it is. All these will see the colour, you won't, yeah? Let's see if I'm right. There we are. Can you see anything? Good. Okay, so I've got uh, my packet of Chris here. There we go. Okay, so you can all see. Yeah, you know what flavor they are. Okay, so I will open these here. Right. Okay. Now, so if I'm wrong about my suspicion, you will say the flavor that is on the packet. Okay, are we ready, Noah? There we go. Shall I put it in your hand? There we go. Have a taste of that. What do we think? What flavor is that? What do, say it again really loud. Ready salted. Ready salted. See? See? You all doubted me, didn't you? You all thought, you all thought that they put different crisps in these packets. They're all, they're all the same. It's just because you can see. Should, should we see what flavor you th it should be? There we go. Look, see, it should be cheese and onion. Should we see if it tastes any different now you can see what it should be? There you go, have one of those. Does it taste any different? Does it taste like cheese and onion now? No. It won't do. Do you know why? Because... Yeah, all right, Vida. Jump ahead. Because this morning, I opened two packets of crisps at the bottom. Can you see? Look, and I've put tape on there. Yeah, so all the cheese and onion crisps are in this packet, and all the salt and vinegar, all the salt and vinegar, all the ready salted crisps are in this packet. Would you like to, which, which was your favorite flavor? Ready salted or cheese and onion? Ready salted, there you go, you can take those away with you then. Thank you, Noah. Let's give him a round of applause for helping me. Sometimes, though, what we see on the outside doesn't necessarily match what's on the inside, does it? So I could, obviously not you, because I've told you what I've done, but I could go out on the street and give someone this packet of crisps, and they'd open it up expecting to have ready salted and be confused when they get cheese and onion flavored crisps. Because the outside doesn't always match what's on the inside. But the important bit is what's on the inside, isn't it? What's on the outside doesn't really matter so much. That's what it tells us in the Bible. It says that God looks at the heart. He's interested on what's going on inside of us. He's not bothered with our outward appearance. And so as we come to our reading later on, we'll see again that reinforced that God is interested in our inner being, our hearts, our thoughts, rather than outward rituals and outward traditions. Let's sing uh, again now, shall we? Um, so, Lord, I come to you. Let me be... Uh, let my heart be changed, renewed. Um, and as we sing this, we'll take up uh, our offering.
Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your many good gifts to us and we ask that you would accept this offering as a sign of our gratitude to you. And Lord, would you use these gifts as well as those given by other means uh, wisely for your glory both here in Bacup and beyond. Amen. Let's continue in prayer now. So Lord God, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving for your faithful love. Your love never fails, not even if we turn away from you or when we ignore your invitation or desert you for gods of our own making. Even then, you do not abandon us, but you reach out again and again, inviting us back into relationship once more. And as you welcome us, so you welcome our prayers. And we bring them to you with confidence, knowing that you will hear and answer. So this, so this morning, Lord, we pray for the world that you created and for the people who share it with us. We pray for countries caught up in war or violent conflict. For those whose homes and lives are threatened by natural disaster. For these and all other areas in our world where there is need and despair. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for our country and for its people. We pray for uh, those who lead us, both nationally and locally. We pray for our cities and towns, rural communities. We pray for employers and employees, for young and for old. Lord, for all who are part of this country, Hear our prayer. And we pray for our local community, for the people of this valley. We pray particularly for those who are unemployed, for those who are hungry, for those who are alone or afraid, for all our neighbours, both known and unknown to us. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for this congregation, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for those who are ill or whose loved ones are ill. We pray for those who are anxious about the future or for those who are struggling with their faith. Lord, for all your people in this place, hear our prayer. Would you pour out your Spirit on us? Would you fix our hearts and our minds on what is true and honourable and right? Lord, give us the joy and peace that comes from knowing and doing your will. And keep us faithful to the call that we have received in Christ Jesus our Lord extending your loving invitation to the world around us. And we bring you all these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Shall we continue to pray using the words that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our reading today comes from Mark chapter 7. Um, And it's the first 23 verses of Mark 7. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honours me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honour your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had from me is Corban, that is, an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on. And you do many things like this. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, Then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach and goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, It is what comes out of a person that defiles, for it is from within from the human heart that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. We're going to think together uh, about that passage in a moment. Um, Before we do, shall we sing uh, once more? Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus.
And I'm sorry, Susan, I've just noticed that I put the wrong number next to that song, didn't I? Well done, you. <laughs> so the story that we've just heard read from Mark chapter 7 seems like a, an odd kind of story. This, there's quite a lot of odd stories, I think, in the Gospels particularly. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I've not only kind of overheard this argument before, but I've kind of participated it. I think I've been on both sides of it. The, the argument about washing your hands before dinner. I think when I was, you know, young, I was the one being told to wash my hands before dinner. And now I'm a parent, I'm the one going, will you just go and wash your hands before you eat? But despite kind of maybe first appearance, this isn't a story just about washing our hands before we eat. Actually, it's a story about traditions or rituals. And I've said before, I know, um, that traditions can be a, a useful thing. Traditions can help to preserve and to pass on important information as long as they are done right. There's a quote by, um, I think I've used this quote before, a man called Gustav Mahler who says, tradition is not the worship of ashes but is the preservation of fire. I like that. I like that idea of what tradition is, that it's handing down the fire from generation to generation. But sometimes I think our traditions and our rituals can become unhelpful, can't they? As we cling on to things beyond their usefulness. Or sometimes even beyond our understanding of why we do them. Have you ever had that conversation with someone and you've said, why do you do it like that? And they say, well, I don't know. We've just always done it that way. This kind of becomes, I think I've told a story, didn't I, about the, the monkeys with the banana. I can't remember it now. But um, there's traditions. That we just kind of, we, we do things, sometimes we do things and we don't really know why we're doing them. We just, it's always been done that way. And sometimes we cling so tightly to, uh, tradi to traditions that we kind of, we forget what they were about and that becomes the most important thing and I, I'll give you an example and I'll need your help for this, um, this example. So just put the next slide up. So at the right bit, I need you to say this line as loudly as you can, okay? But I'll give you some context first. I've talked about being on the beach mission before. And on the beach mission, each year we would have a visitor from Scripture Union, which was the kind of the umbrella organization that we worked for. And whenever we had a, a Scripture Union visitor, someone to come and check that everything was running smoothly and that we were doing things properly, we would play a few pranks on them. And one of the things that we would always do is at lunchtime we would say, we've got a joke to tell you. And the joke was this. How do you sell a deaf man a frog? And the answer is, do you want to buy a frog? And everybody would shout it as loudly as they could. Much like, in fact, let's do that again because I don't think you did it loudly enough. So, how do you sell a frog to a deaf man? Do you want to buy a frog? We're getting there. And we would do that. And it didn't matter the fact that the visitors were quite often had been three or four times. They knew the joke and we would tell it. It was a tradition. And then one year, when I was leading the mission, I got a text message from someone at Scripture Union to say, you're having a, a new lady is coming to visit you tomorrow. She's not been before. Please don't tell her the joke because she won't like it. And so I got this text 
And I took it into my leadership team, and I was like, I can't believe they told us not to tell this joke. And we got all grumpy about it. Who do they think we are? We're going to tell it anyway. And the lady turned up, and she had a hearing aid. And we thought, it's probably best not to tell the joke. (laughs) But for a moment, if I hadn't spotted her hearing aid, we probably would have told the joke. Because who are they to tell me that I can't do this silly tradition, which is rubbish, and it is a rubbish, and probably slightly offensive joke, highly offensive joke maybe, but it's, it was done way before I started on the beach mission, and it was one of these things. We, we always do it. Who are they to tell us we can't do what we always do? And we'd lost sight of kind of why we did it, and it was supposed to be fun, and it kind of lost its funness, and we were going to do it anyway. Sometimes we cling on to tradition, even when it becomes unhelpful, don't we? There's a man called uh, Jaroslav Pelikan, I think, who describes the difference between helpful and unhelpful traditions. Not uh, uh, kind of not as unhelpful as unhelpful, but he describes it as being tradition out versus traditionalism. And so he says this, he says, tradition is the living faith of the dead, but traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. So tradition helps us to know where we've come from, but traditionalism fossilizes what was so that the life of faith comes to a standstill. It kind of freezes us in time. We don't move forward. We just stay there. We do this because we've always done it this way. And that is kind of the point that Jesus is making here to the Pharisees. See, they complain about the disciples not washing their hands. And that's not because they were really concerned about the disciples' kind of hygiene. But they complained because the Pharisees believed that everybody ought to follow the priestly codes and do a kind of ritual hand washing before eating as a sign of purity. And this wasn't kind of in law for people. That's why it's, Jesus says it's a tradition. It's not a commandment. It was only mandated in law for the priests. But the Pharisees who were a kind of sect of 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 ultra-conservative teachers and scribes who were pushing for the Jews to become kind of ever more holy and righteous in order to speed up the coming of God's kingdom. The Pharisees believed that everybody ought to partake in this same ritual. And so the writer uh, Jacob Neusner puts it like this. He says, they talking about the Pharisees, therefore held one must eat his secular food, that is, ordinary everyday meals, in a state of purity, as if one were a temple priest. And so the table of every Jew in his home was seen to be like the table of the Lord in the Jerusalem temple. And so in his argument with them, Jesus points out that this isn't necessary. They don't need to wash their hands. It's not a commandment. They don't need to be doing this. Not only, though, not only is it not necessary, but he points out that by focusing on something that isn't needed and therefore isn't important, they were actually missing out on the things that they ought to be doing, the things which were important. And he gives the example of how they kind of found a loophole to get around an actual commandment, the commandment of honouring your father and your mother. And the loophole was that by declaring kind of money and possessions that they could and should have used to support and to help their parents as Corban, which is reserved for, for the purposes of God, It meant that they could keep that for themselves and they could say, well, actually, I can't use it for you. I can't use it to help you because I'm reserving it in case God needs me to use it. It's a case of kind of keeping the technicality of the law 
but missing the spirit of it. And Jesus says that this is an example of the things within us, our greed, our prejudice, our our anger, our hatred, our lust, that these are the things which make us unclean. Not the outward sign of whether or not you're washing your hands. And it's important to note that this isn't just Jesus making a kind of different list of rules to follow, saying that we don't have to do these things, but you do have to do these things. Rather, he's saying that actually the way that we act or the way that we speak is what reveals our true nature, is what shows our heart. And tellingly, the things that he lists to fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly, as well as the example that he used about honouring your father and mother, these are all things about really how we think about or how we treat other people. They're all about how we kind of interact with others. And we kind of know that that is true, don't we? Because if you want to know what someone is really like, then watch how they interact with others. How do they treat people? How do they speak to people? That will show you what they're like, far more than anything they might say about themselves. Especially the way they treat people who might be considered inferior to them. The people who can't give anything back in return. Those are the moments where we see what people are really like, isn't it? There's a story told about uh, a, a business owner who whenever he would interview someone for a job, would either himself or send one of his managers to sit at the kind of gate near the business, dressed as a beggar, to beg, and see how the people coming in for interview interacted with the beggar. Because that told him what kind of person they are, far more than answering a whole load of interview questions that they'd prepared for. If you want to know what someone's character is like, watch how they treat other people. So what is it that we can take away from this passage? Because we don't have uh, the same arguments today about ritual hand washing, do we? Although that's not to say that you don't have to wash your hands before you eat. Nor do we have the situation of kind of declaring money and possessions to be Corbin, to be reserved by God. But if we're honest, we do love a tradition or two, don't we? There's a joke I heard. How many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? Exactly. Change? Change? My grandfather donated that light bulb. We love a tradition or two, don't we? And so we need to be careful, don't we, that we aren't clinging on to things that aren't important, to the stuff that doesn't matter, that we're not putting tradition or or rituals above that which is really important. And so perhaps we need to ask ourselves the question, what are the things of our faith that we hold on to most fondly? What are the things that we would struggle to live without if it was taken away, that we couldn't imagine doing in a different way? I remember having a conversation, I've spoken before about how I led a kind of church plant onto a housing estate uh, at one point, and um, a lot of people there worked shifts, and so we were talking about the idea that actually meeting at other points in the week, not Sunday morning. And we were having this conversation, I was getting really excited, and I was going, yeah, we could do that, we could do something on a Thursday and that. And then when we, when we got together on a Sunday, we could do this, and the person I was talking to going, no, no, we just wouldn't do Sunday. And I was going, yeah, but you've got to do Sunday, because we're a church, you've got to be on Sunday morning. I really struggled to get my head around the idea that 
we wouldn't meet together on a Sunday morning. I wonder what are the things for you that actually would just, you would struggle if it got taken away. And then once you've discovered that, what are the things that you would struggle with? What are the things that really matter to you? You need to, we perhaps need to ask ourselves, are they the things that really matter? They might matter to us, but are they the things that really matter? Are they the things that Jesus would care about if he were on earth here in Bake Up today? Because what we see, both from today's passage and throughout the gospel stories, I think, is that Jesus is far more interested in our heart, in our inmost, innermost being, rather than in our outward shows of religion or any traditions that we might have. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, then, is Be Thou My Vision. Let's stand together as we sing.